All, All right. right. No problem. So hi, everybody. Today, we're going to be going over starting solids, which is an introduction to feeding your baby. Um, now, I'm here from Little Eaters Academy, which is nutrition counseling workshops and one on one nutrition counseling. And I cover pregnancy, postpartum, breastfeeding, first foods, baby led weaning, toddler nutrition, preschool nutrition, and everything is with an intuitive eating approach, which we'll talk a little bit about what that means today too. Um, I just wanna introduce myself. So my name is Christina Toscano. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, and I'm also a mom to two little eaters of my own. So I have a five-year-old and a one-year-old. So I've gone through all of these stages and I'm still going through some of these stages myself. I did put my email address and my phone number here um, in case anybody has any questions after today. You're definitely welcome to reach out to me and I can always provide you with whatever resources I think might benefit you. So to start off, um, I just wanted to start with this. You're at a very special point right now in your child's life because you are able to set the foundations for what sort of relationship your child is going to have with food throughout their life. So I want you to just take a moment to imagine the best case scenario that you would want for your child. I'm a big believer in envisioning things and making them happen. So thinking about it, what sort of relationship do you want them to have with food as they grow up? So for this, feel free to unmute yourself and share if you'd like to, um, so we can kind of brainstorm together. But in a perfect world, how would you want your child's relationship with food to be? Um, I kind of brainstormed reflecting on my own children and what I want for them as they get older. So here are some ideas that I came up with. Um, for me, a healthy relationship with food for my littles would be that they eat food and nourish their body and that it gives them the energy to do the things they love, that they recognize and respect hunger and fullness cues. I know one of you was talking about that, about being able to tell when they're hungry versus full. Um, Avoiding jumping from fad diet to fad diet. I would be sad if my daughter spent her life, or either of them, you know, avoiding foods because they want to stick with the newest fad diet and feeling hungry all the time and things like that. I would want them to be well nourished and eating healthy for their body, but, but avoiding all of that. Um, eats a balanced diet with a variety of many different kinds of foods. I heard some of you mentioning that. And then loves their body for all of the things that it can do. So that's what I would want for my children. And I think a lot of you did touch on these points as well. So now I want you to just think about this one. What does your own relationship with food look like? So all of those things we just talked about that we would want for our kids, is that how our relationship with food is? So one of the best things that you can actually do now that you're starting a feeding relationship for, with your child that's gonna you know, set the foundations for how they view food, one of the best ways you can help them is actually to work on your own relationship with eating, with foods. Um, so I just wanted to add that in there because I think that it's really important. Um, one great approach to healing your own relationship with food is intuitive eating. Um, which this is a book in case you enjoy reading. I'm sure Kimmy could look up and see if they have it at the library that you are at, um, because this is definitely a book I recommend when it comes to healing your own relationship with food and um, can help you with setting healthy foundations for your child. They also do have a website, which you can go on. If you Google it, um, just look that Evelyn Triple and Elise Rush are the two dietitians who came up with this. So make sure that it's their website because they'll be the ones who have the correct information. There have been a couple of like copycat sites which may not have all the right information, but I know you can go to the website and you can um, get information there if you prefer not reading. If you like to read though, they'll check the library, um, check, they also, you can get the Kindle app on your phone and read it that way. And sometimes libraries actually help you rent books via Kindle. I'm not sure, Kimmy, if that's something you guys do. It is awesome. I think that's so cool. So you could rent it for free on your Kindle, which is a great op option, but it's all about honoring health by listening and responding to the direct messages of the body in order to meet your physical and physiological needs. So that is just the basics, very basics of what intuitive eating is in case anybody wants to read further about it. Um, but back to feeding. Oh, yes, I see a question. Um, they have it in audible.com. I have oh, okay. audible. Awesome. So then they can read it to you as well. I think it's just a good approach when it comes to just 
helping heal your relationships so that you can help your little ones create good relationships with food. Um, th the main goals though, when you're feeding your baby are definitely in this order, number one, safety. Also number two, creating the foundations for a positive feeding relationship. And then number three, that's the last one, but still important, but just the others are even higher up on the importance list is what actually goes in their mouth. So when their baby's top priority, obviously is safety after that is creating that healthy relationship. So everybody has to figure out what method works best for them. While I am gonna focus a little more on baby led weaning today because that's something that's very popular and that people may not know as much about, I do want to say that every person, every individual you know, has their own situations. So you have to figure out what works best for your body and um, for your child's body. And so here are the two most common methods of feeding little ones. So we have purees. When you're feeding purees, you would be feeding your child with a spoon and your child often eats baby cereal and pureed foods. With baby led weaning, your child feeds themselves and your child eats what you are eating prepared in a safe way. So you don't have to make a separate baby food for your babies if you do baby led weaning. You can give them what you're eating just in a safe way, reducing choking hazard risk. So here's another comparison between purees and baby led weaning. So with purees, your baby is eating alone, meaning you're sitting there and spoon feeding them so you can't be you know, having a family meal and eating yourself. With baby led weaning, they actually encourage family meals all together. So you eating yourself, your older children eating, also everybody eating at the table at the same times because your child will pick up a lot on your eating habits that way. Um, with purees, you have to make them the, a special pureed baby food or purchase it. With baby led weaning, they can eat what you're eating in a safe way. Um, with purees, they don't touch and feel the food as often because you're feeding them with that spoon. With baby led weaning, they're grabbing and touching everything, which is really good for their sensory development. Um, with purees, it's often the same texture. You start a little waterier and then you get thicker and thicker. With baby led weaning, they're being exposed to so many different textures and shapes. With purees, the pace is decided by the parent. So the parent is the one, you know, feeding the baby and slowing down when they think the baby's probably hungry and you're guessing, but you're not in their body. With baby led weaning, the child is actually choosing the pace because they may eat a little bit and they may stop before you thought they would be done, or they may eat more than you thought they would eat. And honestly, children are very good at knowing if they're hungry or if they, if they are full. Um, they know their signals better than we know ours after years of you know, diets and other factors influence our ability to tell when we're hungry and full, but children are born knowing um, unless they have some sort of disorder or something, they're usually the best bet. So it may seem like they're eating a ton or it may seem like they're living on air, but as long as they're growing well in the growth curve, it's actually good to kind of let them do their thing. So with baby led weaning, the baby is actually choosing their pace. They're going to stop when they're done and you're not going to, you know, encourage them to eat more. You're just going to let that be it. Um, and then with purees, they're kind of getting unexpected bites sometimes. With baby led weaning, the baby is consciously choosing each bite. So that's kind of a comparison of the experience. And you can kind of think of it yourself too. Like, how would you feel if you're kind of sitting there and somebody's just, um, you know, bringing the fork to your mouth and it would be a lot harder to listen to your own self telling you if you're full or hungry. Now, eventually the baby will probably turn their head. So if you are choosing purees, it's very important to pay really good attention to their cues and to slow down and let them, you know, stop when they're st they want to stop, even if there's a little more food in the baby food container. Now we said safety was number one. So here are a couple of tips on how to create a safe eating environment for your baby, because that is so, so important. Number one is something that Kimmy mentioned she did, which is definitely recommended, is having anyone who's caring for your baby attend a training on CPR and also first aid and choking. So they'll tell you what to do in an emergency situation, which of course we would like to avoid, but it's also good to have that knowledge just in case as a backup. 
Um, next is serve food in a safe way. So you want to avoid choking hazards and be present. So you don't want to, you know, be sitting there on your phone and not even like looking at baby while they're eating. You want to be very engaged and paying attention. Um, next is don't start salads until baby is ready. That's an important one. And we're going to talk about how to tell. And then if you choose to baby led wean, make sure that you allow baby to feed themselves from plate to mouth. So if you're baby led weaning, what you don't want to do is take a chunk of food and hand it to their mouth for them to, you know, bite onto. It's important that they be the ones to bring it from wherever the food is up to their mouth. So here are some foods that you want to avoid in order to keep baby safe and healthy. So we I have, have a question. Yes. I have a question for you. Let's see. You see how if I try baby led me, we don't we don't eat with our fingers. Let's say me and my husband. It's just us three. Yeah. And even even with the purees now, like let's say I leave him for one second, like to go get a napkin. Instead of him grabbing inside of the plate, he'll like grab the the spoon to put it inside the plate, you know? So oh. how would I do you think eventually he'll just grab the food or should I like put food and a utensil down? It depends. You could do a little of both depending on what kind of food you're serving. Okay. Um, okay. We'll talk about the shape if you want to try baby lead weaning that is ideal. And if you're giving something oh, in that okay. shape, it'll be easy for them to pick up. But I was actually talking about this before we got started with with Katie here, um, they sell certain spoons that are very baby friendly. So there's one, I think the brand is like Sprouts or something. I got it on Amazon and it looks like a green thing with a triangle at the end and it's soft and it's the perfect shape for the baby to hold. So you could dip a little bit in whatever it is and then hand the baby the spoon and see if they're able to bring it to their mouth that way. So that's an option, but also that would be in combination with, you know, offering the the long, thin strips of food, which we'll talk about soon. But that was a good question. Um, so foods to avoid, we want to avoid small, round, sticky, and hard foods because those are all choking hazards. So these are just some examples. It's not every choking hazard, but some common examples that you want to just avoid, um, at least giving whole, would be raisins. You want to just completely avoid at this age. Um, you know, unless it were blended with a liquid and then a completely different texture, but raisins, we want to take off the list. Grapes are another one because they are small and round. So that's a, a definite choking hazard. However, there is a way to cut them very thinly in half long ways and then in half again, so that they will be thin strips. Um, nuts, we definitely want to avoid is or thickly spread nut butters. What you can do if you're introducing nut butter is make either mix it into something so you don't have that sticky texture or put a very, very thin bit on something like a cracker. And what that does is that keeps it from being balled up because the nut butter can ball up and make that round sticky shape. Um, we wanna avoid pieces of raw carrots like baby carrots. Those are too hard for baby and they won't be able to chew them down when they're first starting. Same with pieces of raw apples. So anything with a similar texture to that, you wanna be extra careful with. So you don't wanna just give them a chunk of a raw apple. You could um, boil it and make it soft that way with a little bit of cinnamon or bake it and then see if the texture is softer um, if you wanna be feeding them apples or pears. Some breads are also a choking hazard because if they bite the bread, sometimes they, it will clump up into that ball shape as well. Um, biscuits, for example, are one that really takes the shape when you're eating them. So you wanna be really careful with bread. You don't wanna just hand them a big thing of bread. Um, and then we went over nut butters. The next ones to avoid, and this is for foodborne illness reasons, would be honey until they're a year old because there is a foodborne illness called botulism that is very dangerous for babies. So we wanna just avoid honey until they turn one year and then raw meat and fish. And then we also want to avoid or at least limit the highly processed foods. So artificial sweeteners, so lots of salt and sugar added, things that people consider, you know, junk foods, things that are in the containers, prepackaged chips, things like that. We, they, babies don't really need them. Um, so the best thing for them would be like the whole foods. So is your baby ready to start solids? Here are three things you wanna look for. 
Number one is, is your baby six months or older? Now, the day they turn six months doesn't necessarily mean they're ready. You may think that they're ready and then they try it and they're gagging a lot and don't seem ready. So then you wait a little while. Um, but you don't want to start much before six months because you want to wait for them to be ready. Um, next is they can sit unassisted. So rather than if they can sit in a bumble seat or some sort of seat that holds them up and but they kind of slouch off, that's not what I mean. I mean, you put them on the floor with nothing around them and they can stay sitting totally unassisted. And then they're interested and able to bring food or toys to their mouth. That's the other sign that they're ready because then they can be feeding themselves. Um, when you're planning for your baby's first time eating, it's an exciting time. You want to make sure that you're giving them food when the timing is right. So you want the ideal conditions. Baby should not be tired or hungry, which seems kind of counterintuitive because you're feeding them. But if they're too hungry and this is the first time they're experimenting with food, then they can get frustrated um, or they can try to eat too quickly. So we just want to make sure that they're at a comfortable point in the day. Um, you want to include baby when you are eating. So the best time to give them a first food is actually if you're sitting down and also eating at that time. And you want to make sure you're giving them appropriate foods. So how to do it. Um, it's a good idea to have them either in a high chair or on your lap with the tray close to baby's body. Um, one tip that I think is really helpful is to have a tablecloth, a shower curtain, a splat mat, whatever mat that you can quickly put in the washing machines spread out on the floor under their high chair. That way, when they start throwing things on the floor, you don't freak out as much. You know that at the end of the day, you can just stick it in the washing machine and clean it. So I definitely recommend having that ready. And then put the food either directly in the baby's hand or even better, just on the tray or on a plate. This is my, my baby having her first food. And she mashed up the avocado a lot herself. So it's not exactly baby led weaning wedges, but it was just kind of for her to taste and play with and get messy. Yum. That's my husband. <laughs> but as you can see, we're a little bit extra. We did a whole avocado thing because we were excited about her having avocados. Um, so choosing a first food, whether it's puree feeding or baby led weaning, here are some ideas. So if you're puree feeding, a lot of the time pediatricians will recommend baby cereal because it has iron added, which we'll definitely talk more about iron later. So if you choose to do that, it can be a great idea to mix it with breast milk if you're breastfeeding so that they're getting some of the antibodies and that they're having a flavor that they're used to. You could also do any other type of puree you want. Some people have the theory that you should start with purees that are vegetables because they think that once they have the sweet fruit, they'll never eat the vegetable because they'll only want the sweetness. So it's really up to you what you think and how you wanna do it if you choose to do puree feeding. If you choose baby led weaning, you can start with pretty much anything. I would just start with something that's kind of one ingredient. Um, so here is a list of some ideas and how to prepare them, um, which I can email out this handout to you because I have the, the blue part is actually a handout so that you can see how to prepare them. Um, but some ideas you can start with are bananas, sweet potato fries, which would be baked usually, um, long thin strips of omelet. Some people start with a chicken drumstick. They just remove the pointy pointy uh, bones. So those are you know the really intense baby led weaning people. Um, pancakes that are soft and not gonna ball up, but that are gonna fall apart and long strips of avocado that is also soft and ripe. Um, so here is the ideal size. First foods should be offered to baby. They, they should be easy to grab because their coordination is very limited. Babies can, at that age can only close their fists. So small pieces of food are too difficult for them to grab. They don't have that pincer grasp yet. They are kind of using their whole fist. Um, at the beginning, they can't even consciously open the, their fist in order to reposition the food. So if they pick up the food wrong, they can't open it and reposition it. So that's why like a large piece of food works best. However, you wanna choose something that's a good texture. It may be large, but it falls apart easily. Um, a, a, food, a food rule of thumb is to use the pinky. That is a really great shape and size. So you're using your pinky 
and about the width and height of your pinky or of an adult pinky finger usually works best. That way the food sticks out of their fist and they can chew on it. And then as I said, texture is key here. So you wanna prepare foods that are firm enough that baby can hold them and grab them that way, but soft enough that they can easily take bites and don't pose a choking risk. So we're gonna go through the different food groups and give you some ideas for how you can serve foods in each food group. Um, and I actually do have a baby led weaning cookbook that has a couple of recipes that I can email to you after this as well. So meatballs are actually a really great starter food when you're introducing meat or meat alternatives because you can make them so that baby can hold them, but they fall apart easier. You don't wanna use you know, those rubbery pre-made meatballs that are like a hard circle, but if you're thinking like a homemade one that kind of falls apart, that can be a really good option. Um, you can make your own with ground meat or meat alternatives and vegetables. Um, later on, you can introduce tender, slow cooked meat like pulled pork, meat on a bone, but without the skin and pointy bone. And the American Academy of Pediatrics does state that a vegetarian diet can be healthy for children. So if you choose that option, or if you just wanna offer some meat alternatives as well, you could try a lentil loaf, chickpea patties, um, soft beans or lentils as they start to develop that pincer grasp a little later. I like to just rinse off beans and smush them a little bit so they're not that circle shape. And then my daughter will pick them up that way. So that's as they start to get a little older and pick things up like this. What do you think, Ava? Yum. Yum? So that's my daughter having a meatball last night, a veggie meatball. Um, we're vegetarians, so she was having a plant-based one with peas and other legumes and things, but she really liked it. And as you can see, it's pretty easy for them to hold. So when you're serving veggies, you wanna serve big pieces that are hard enough to hold, but soft enough the baby can take bites easily. You could roast them, steam them, boil them, or pan fry them. Um, raw veggies, however, are often a choking hazard for little ones who are starting eating. So some examples could be roasted sweet potatoes shaped like fries. That's that pinky shape, that perfect pinky shape we were talking about in fries, but you can roast them instead of frying them to make them a little healthier. Um, steamed broccoli or sliced avocados that are that same size. And then a tip is to add olive oil so that your baby is getting some healthy fat as well, which is really important for baby brain development. Um, most babies have a very hard time with leafy greens like kale, lettuce, or spinach, and that can definitely be a choking hazard. So if you want to offer kale, lettuce, or spinach, you could try to cook them in an omelet, you know, shred them first and then cook them, put them in an omelet, roast them as chips that fall apart easily, or you can add them to smoothies. So they can still have them just prepared in safe ways. And now fruits. Ripe fruit can be a really easy food to give your child and something you can pack with yourself on the go. Um, it's very important to, to pay special attention to the shape and texture of the food. Ripe bananas are a great option. I know Kimmy, you were saying at first you were scared about giving the bananas. Ripe ones are the best ones because they fall apart easier. Um, when they're still a little greenish, those are fine for grownups to eat um, and actually, are a good option for grown up seed. But for kids, you definitely want as ripe as possible. And then you want to avoid raw apple or pear wedges, which can form those hard clumps that we want to be careful with or anything of a similar texture, unless you boil them or roast them so they're soft. Now iron actually supports proper brain development during infancy and early childhood. So it's so important that babies are getting enough iron. And right now their iron needs are pretty high. So one way that you can make sure your child is getting enough iron, and this is something they're gonna test for when your kid turns a year old at the pediatrician, they usually do a blood test to see if they were getting enough. Um, but if they're not one yet, or you're not sure, it's a good idea to try to make sure they are getting enough. So one trick that you can do to make sure that the meals have enough iron for your baby are to choose one food for column. And you can always look up and add more ideas, but it basically you wanna choose one food high in iron, 
one food high in vitamin C, and that's because vitamin C helps the body absorb the iron. So together they help each other and they're important to pair and have at the same meals. Um, and then a food that's high in energy or fat because baby needs, babies have such high fat needs compared to grownups or older kids because they're growing their brain and their brain needs a lot of fat in order to get the energy that it needs and in order for them to grow. So you're choosing an iron, a vitamin C, and a high energy food. So an example here, we have an omelet. Now, if you do an omelet, you would cut it in very long strips that are kind of pinky width. Um, then for vitamin C, we have a piece of kiwi without the peel. And then for energy, we have a large wedge of tomato, which that's not a fat, but then with olive oil coating all over it. And that is the fat. So that could be one meal idea. And this is another handout I can always send you, um, but it just gives a bunch of different ideas within each group. But the idea is if you're choosing one from each of these, then for at least two meals or so a day, then you know your kid will be you know, getting exposed to enough iron. Iron is also added to baby cereals. So if you are giving baby cereal um, because you're giving pureed food, make sure that it has it added, but it usually does. If you're not giving um, pureed baby cereal, you can actually use it to bake. This morning, my daughter is downstairs right now eating a muffin that I made because she's baby led weaning. I didn't use the um, baby cereal to give her a puree. What I did was I baked it with mashed banana and an egg and I made a muffin and applesauce. So it was a little naturally sweet. And um, yeah, so that way they can also have the iron fortified baby cereal even if you choose to do more of a baby led weaning approach. Now let's talk about allergies. This is definitely a hot topic when it comes to starting um, foods. Introducing common allergens early and safely can actually help reduce the risk of developing allergies later in life. This is kind of new information that they found out because in the past they would say just avoid it when they're babies, but then they noticed that the rates of allergies were going up. So they realized it's actually good for them to have some introduction to these allergens. However, I recommend, you know, spacing it out. So you don't want to in one day, give them a whole bunch of allergens. You want to introduce one at a time, maybe wait three or so days, just if you want to be extra safe. Um, if you have a high family history of allergies in your family, definitely talk to your pediatrician first and come up with a plan for how you want to do it. Me being me and always being extra careful. I only like to introduce allergens during a time when I know my doctor is in. So like I wouldn't do it, you know, on a Saturday night. I would do it Monday to Friday before 5 p.m. just because I like to be extra careful. Um, I know my sister was really worried about peanut allergies. I guess she had a relative on her husband's side who had one. And so she went to the parking lot of her doctor, of her the pediatrician and introduced something with peanuts there. Um, and my daughter actually has a bunch of allergies. So we're gonna do a test where we introduce something to the baby in the allergist office, I made an appointment. So you have options where you can do it safely, but it is a really good idea to introduce them in a safe way, um, depending Christy, on- the um, <clears throat> I, I was also very nervous. <clears throat> and um, I went to um, a hospital parking lot. And- There you go, see? <laughs> peanut butter. Yeah, because I was just like so stressed about it. And he was fine, but and like I remember there was a security guard that like drove up and was like, Is everything okay here? I was like, Oh yeah, just introducing giving my you know. kid. That's awesome. That's yeah. Time. yeah. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and another trick if you're worried about something, you can like for example, peanuts. That's a common one. Um, if you're worried about that, you could put it on their arm first and see if they get any sort of skin reaction, because that could also tell you. Um, here I have pictures of the most common allergens. You can really be allergic to anything, but these are the most common ones. We have eggs, nuts, so that could be tree nuts, like almonds, cashews, hazelnuts, or it could be peanuts. Um, we have soy, which would be like tofu or edamame, um, milk dairy, and then shellfish or fish or any kind of seafood. And now a really common one that is growing and growing right now is sesame seeds. That's something we don't think of, but it's kind of getting up there with peanuts now where kids are having more serious reactions to sesame seeds. And then grains, so wheat, um, like bread, flour, pasta, those sort of things. So 
When you introduce any of these foods, you want to watch baby for any signs of allergic reactions. That could be swelling around the mouth, redness, red dots. It could also be diarrhea, vomiting. Um, and the reactions usually occur within 15 minutes. So you want to introduce a food, wait 15 minutes, monitor them. And then if they do fine, you could start another food a couple days later. So that is the basics of introducing allergies. Um, so we've talked a little bit about creating a healthy relationship with, with your own eating. We've talked about, you know, safety, what to choose for their first food, what kind of environment to do it in, how to serve foods if you choose baby led weaning. Um, so I just wanted to go over a little more about creating a healthy feeding relationship for your child with eating. So there's something called the division of responsibility. And what that basically is, is when you're feeding your child, who should decide what? And this is definitely something I can go more in depth in, in like a private session, or if, if I come back to do like a picky eating kind of workshop, we can go over more about it. But basically, it's really important to kind of stick to your own responsibilities when it comes to feeding and set that up from the beginning. So in an ideal world, the parent would decide what is served. So for today, for lunch, we're going to have this food. And then when you're starting solids, they're slowly becoming responsible for when it is served and where it is served. The reason I say becoming responsible is because babies, when you're nursing, for example, they're feeding on demand. I see someone feeding on demand right now, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, so in that case, they're deciding when and where nursing is happening, which is great. Um, but when it comes to solids, and offering the meals, the parent should be deciding when and where it is served. And then the baby gets to decide whether they eat what is served. And if they don't eat what is served, that's it. That's what they're getting, which is the hard part. Um, and then how much they get, they eat from what is served. So if your child barely touches their plate, that's actually within their responsibilities and that's okay. And you know that you're gonna serve another meal in a few hours, but you don't wanna then just start dishing out snacks or making another meal. Um, and then how much they eat from what is served, they might barely touch it, they might eat a lot of it, and that's okay. Um, you never wanna limit seconds for your child. You wanna give them a balanced plate. And then if they still want more, they can have more because it's all part of learning. And if they overeat, that's okay because then they'll know what overeating feels like and they'll know next time that, that they should eat a little less. It's all part of them creating a healthy relationship with food. Um, and I have another book that you guys could read that I recommend that I think is so helpful with this that I will show you at the very end of this presentation. Also, I have a picture of it in case you want to look it up. So I have it here, actually. So if you want to learn more, because today was really just an intro, because I mean, my baby led waiting presentation itself is like two hours if I did it all in one. So today was like very basic. Um, but if you want to learn more, there's the intuitive eating book, which I showed you guys, and here's their website. There's the division of responsibility. That's the little chart that I showed you at the end about who decides what. And that is a book called Child of Mine by someone called Ellen Satter. But you can also go on her website and just read the information. So I put her website there for you. Um, Next, I have Baby Led Weaning, and this is a book about baby led weaning. This was recommended to me by a colleague because honestly, what I've learned has been like in textbooks and in attending seminars and continuing education credits and things like that. So I haven't actually read this whole book yet, but it was recommended to me by a bunch of dietitians in the solid. The, I'm in a baby led weaning international dietitian coalition kind of group. So I was getting their advice on a book to share with you guys because I thought you might want to read a book as well. Then there's my website, which is littleeatersacademy.com, where I'm going to be adding more information. I kind of just launched this private practice. Before that, I was working in community education for nutrition. So I will add more to my website. So you can always check on that. And then I offer, I'll be offering my own private workshops, which will be more in depth and more information, and also one on one nutrition counseling. So if you have specific questions, I know some of you had brought up some things going on in your families, I can always work with you one on one as well. So these are where you can find more information. Um, if any topic interested you today, or you have more questions, and you can always reach out to me, my email address is just littleeatersacademy at gmail.com.
So I want to thank you guys for having me today. Um, I wish I could go on and on, but I know we had about a half hour and kind of went over that. So I was able to go over the basics with you. You have some resources to learn more. And then I would love if you guys have the time, if you could fill this out, which is like a little survey that I made so that I can learn more so that I can get my presentations to be better and better. I want to learn about what your thoughts were. And I also put in it, if you want to share your email address, then I can email you. Um, I have the handout on iron. I have a handout, which I have a little PDF of like a recipe book for baby led weaning that has some recipe information and things like that. So I can email that to you. And then if you're interested, I can also add you to receive emails from me, which may have information about future workshops or an article about new information about baby led weaning or feeding babies, things like that. So that's totally up to you. Um, I have the link here, which I'm gonna try to put in the chat for you and you can indicate what you're comfortable with within that. Um, let me see how I can get back to my chat box. Um, and I just wanted to jump in <clears throat> that um, the books that Christy mentioned, uh, apart from the um, that last one, the baby led weaning, because I just, I didn't have a chance to click on the link or anything, but, um, we have a Libby, it's Libby app, L-I-B-B-Y, um, and you can, as long as you have a library card, you can put in your library card and your PIN number, um, and it opens up like a bunch of different um, books, like audiobooks and um, ebooks that you can um you can get a loan from a library for like seven days and um the intuitive eating is on the libby app in the westchester library system um and then if you came into the library we don't have intuitive eating here at the library yet um but we are connected to the westchester library system and there's a bunch of different copies that i can put on hold for you to um to take out from the library they just take like about like three to five days to get here um once you put it on hold um katie i know you're not in this area but i think i think you use libby as well though so um you definitely look on on libby to find intuitive eating um and it's great because it's free and you just have access to audio and ebooks um <clears throat> that are available there and and baby led we need you know that what that book in particular might be on there as well i just i'm just not 100 percent sure but i just want to mention that they, they are here at the library that's awesome that's great to know and then you guys can look up the other two books the child of mine and the baby led weaning book and see what they have but it's always good to to learn as much as you can and today really was just an intro so i want you guys to have some resources you can refer to in the future i put